because it, it's so valuable to the developer who really just wants to solve problems for their business. That is Joe Kuttner, a software architect here at Salesforce. I'm Josh Burke, your host for the Salesforce Developer Podcast. And here on the podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down and talk with Joe about cloud-native build packs, Heroku, Kubernetes, Docker, and all sorts of really cool technology. But before we get started, I just once again want to thank everybody and give a shout out to all of my listeners because last week, as we were recording this, we passed past 100,000 downloads. So again, my huge thanks and very grateful for everybody listening. And here's to another 100,000 coming your way. Now, let's sit down and talk with Joe. And we start, as usual, with his early years. Yeah, I've always enjoyed computing and, and, and building things mm -hmm. with software. Um, but I definitely have always had a tilt towards building things that people can use that are accessible mm. uh that y you know are sort of a, at a layer above some of the the deeper nitty-gritty stuff mm -hmm. um and i think that probably ties into what we'll talk about today gotcha what was like your early experience with computers oh building games like everybody oh, else nice <laughs> nice what games oh just text-based stuff you know uh which interestingly enough is what my son still is doing today uh mm. you know question and answer type of role playing things and little ASCII art on a screen. Nice. The good old Zork days. Yeah. Okay. And you come to Salesforce by way of Heroku. How did you get started over at Heroku? Yeah. So I joined Heroku after it had been acquired by Salesforce, but only shortly after. Uh, so at the time it was still sort of functioning as its own uh, independent business. And over the years we've, you know, we started uh, when I joined Heroku uh, very much focused on developer experience. We still are. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, in the more recent years, we're trying to bring those principles and values that led to the Heroku developer experience to the Salesforce platform. Gotcha. And just a high level level set in case we're talking to Salesforce developers who aren't familiar with the Heroku platform, what's the elevator pitch for the Heroku platform? Yeah. So the Heroku platform is a place to run your apps in the cloud. Uh, and when I say apps in that context, I'm talking about programs that are written with frameworks like Spring Boot in Java or Ruby and Rails, things that require custom code and usually handle HTTP requests, uh, those kinds of apps. But when you're running them on Heroku, you're working at a higher level abstraction than mm -hmm. something like AWS or Google Cloud. Uh, those providers are offering infrastructure as a service where you have to manage uh, your virtual machines and your virtual infrastructure Whereas on Heroku, you're focused on uh, processes mm -hmm. and really your application. Got it. And in the early days, Heroku was very Ruby focused and then other languages and frameworks came on board. And then eventually there was this concept of, of build packs. What was the impetus of build packs and what were they like in those early days? The impetus was to support more languages because mm -hmm. you're right. It, uh, Heroku started in the Ruby ecosystem uh, in the early 2010s, you know, Ruby was was really gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. And so just supporting Ruby was enough to run a business on. Um, but very quickly, you know, we we learned that we had to support languages like Java, JavaScript, Python. And we needed an extension point in the platform, something that would allow the platform to um, have some kind of modular component that could extend its capabilities. Uh, and build packs were that thing. They allowed us to add support for other languages and other tools without having to reconstruct the platform itself. And I kind of remember those days as like, I, I guess I was interfacing with kind of the standard build packs. Correct me if I'm wrong. There were some really weird build packs in the, those, back in those days. Is, oh, there any still of those, are. <laughs> there still are. What's, what's like the weirdest build pack that you can think of right now? Oh, it's my favorite. It's the, the Minecraft build pack. <sighs> it allows you to run a Minecraft server on Heroku. Uh, I use it with my son. Nice. Uh, he uses it with his friends. It seems totally trivial and meaningless. Well, maybe not some people. But it's actually an interesting <laughs> build pack in that it exposes some really difficult uh, or solves some really difficult problems because you have mm -hmm. to like use a secure tunnel to connect to the server. You can't just connect to it over HTTP. Mm -hmm. um, so it actually is a has been a great example of the power that build packs bring and allow you to use them in, a, in still in a very simple way. 
And I kind of remember my early days working with Heroku that it really clicked with me once I had that like, I, and I think that's what you were just talking about. Like, like I'm a Node guy, I'm a JavaScript guy, and I can really just focus on my app and telling Heroku what my app needs to run, and then just just watching that deployment just sort of magically unfold uh, at kind of a basic level. Can you walk me through like some of that magic, like like from detection to compilation of up on the server? Yeah, absolutely. So. If you're deploying an application or your source code to Heroku, the first step is transporting that code to the platform. And then the platform will detect what kind of app it is, and it uses build packs to do that. So the build pack will inspect your code to look for particular files that indicate what kind of project it is. Mm -hmm. For example, a package JSON would say this is a Node app, right. or a gem file would indicate that it's a Ruby app. So in most cases, it it can just automatically figure out what kind of app it is. And then from there, it uh, uses the appropriate tools for that language ecosystem. So for the JavaScript ecosystem, it's going to run NPM to download your dependencies for Java and other compiled languages. It, it'll compile your source code. And it goes through this whole process sort of intelligently or in a way that's app aware of preparing your source code for production. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the end result is an image that contains everything your application needs to run on the Heroku platform in the cloud mm -hmm. uh, and to launch processes from. And what are some big benefits from a development cycle that you get from that kind of process? The biggest benefit is that you don't have to worry about it. In most cases, <laughs> right. probably 80% of cases, it just works. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I love talking about build packs, but I, I would say most of Heroku's users don't really understand what a build pack is, even though right. they use one every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it occurs to me the first time that I actually felt the need to, to set my no node server up in like local host mode to do local testing because simply lifting and shifting it up to Heroku was one command line away. And it, would you say, I mean, this was pretty brand new, innovative stuff when it came out. Nobody else was really doing it. And it feels like it kind of started this fundamental shift to the way, especially cloud computing was getting built and deployed and scaled. Do you think that's an accurate statement? Yeah, absolutely. What Heroku introduced was, like you said, a sort of a single command. You mm -hmm. push, you, know, you git push if you're using git. Uh, that was the old days. Now we have a couple of mechanisms where you can automatically sync from GitHub and things like that. Right. But in any case, it's, a, it's in the best case, a single step. And the platform handles provisioning all of the, the server instances and the compute resources that are necessary to run your app, including databases and things like that. And this is this was a huge departure, especially when Heroku was first introduced uh, from AWS or other cloud providers, which gave you this sort of smorgasbord of resources that you could provision, but didn't really enforce any kind of opinions about how you should architect them, hmm. other than maybe, you know, like a white paper or something like that. And I think it's a I think that sort of opinionated approach to the underlying infrastructure is something that other platforms are still trying to emulate today because it, it's so valuable to the developer who really just wants to solve problems for their business. Mm -hmm. Th those developers working on the Ruby on Rails or the Spring Boot app that we talked about, um, when they're toiling away on upgrading the operating system in their virtual machine, they're really not adding value to their business. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just doing chores. And right. our goal at Heroku is to take a lot of that off your plate. Gotcha. With that kind of momentum and shift, though, it seems like a lot of other people were starting to come to the party. We start getting competing APIs, other projects can do things like converting apps to images. Can you talk a little bit about that competition and then how something like cloud native build packs are resolving that balkanization? Right. So build packs in particular were um, borrowed or or the uh, the design for build packs was used by other platforms. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the early days, I don't think we were really ready for that. So mm. there were Heroku build packs and then there were Cloud Foundry build packs. And uh, there were some that were used on other 
other platforms too, but they were different things and they didn't really work together well. Um, so what, we, what we've been trying to do uh, with the Cloud Native Build Packs project, which is sort of the next version of Build Packs, is to unify that ecosystem. And that brings value to the platforms that support Build Packs and that once you support Build Packs, you can use all the Build Packs that are out there and available, including mm-hmm. the Minecraft Build Pack. <laughs> uh, nice. But it also means that our, you know, our customers can create Build Packs are uh, people who work in open source ecosystems for different languages can create build packs and have them used on lots of different platforms. Just out of curiosity, or, or maybe it already is, but I'm curious as to kind of porting effort to take the, the Minecraft build pack and convert it to the cloud native format. Uh, that one was uh, not too bad. Mm-hmm. Um, so we do provide a shim where we can take old build packs uh, using the old build build pack API and run them on the new infrastructure with the new API. Mm -hmm. Uh, You just have to give up some of the capabilities that are available. Uh, So the Minecraft one is, you know, one that that has an implementation in in both APIs. I think the for someone who is familiar with the old API and was Mm -hmm. trying to move to the new API, there's some important things you have to learn. But the, the sort of fundamentals of what constitutes a build pack are still largely the same. Uh, There's a couple entry points, essentially scripts or executables that get run by the platform. The inputs and outputs of those have changed, but the the concept is still largely the same. Got it. Uh, Tell me a little bit about, because obviously open source, portability, these are all good things that developers love. Talk to me a little bit about some of those new capabilities, though, in the new API that that maybe weren't supported in the original one. Yeah, one of the biggest, um, well, I guess there's two two ways to look at this internal Mm -hmm. to build packs like how does this make the build pack experience better Um, and in that respect the layers that are available uh, in the image format that we use Mm -hmm. uh, allow you to transfer your images more quickly without duplication so basically the old build packs created a sort of proprietary format image it was just a one compressed file of files and then In this new format, we're following a specification called the OCI image format, which is essentially just the format that Docker images use. Mm -hmm. So this is a standard ecosystem format. And it breaks down that single compressed file into lots of compressed files. But then it calculates a hash for each of those files, which are called layers. And then if two runs of a build pack produce the same layer, it can deduplicate those. Mm. So for example, my operating system that's a part of my image will be composed of many layers, uh, probably mm-hmm. a dozen or so. Mm. And another app that's running on the same operating system will have those same 12 layers. So mm. when I deploy or release that image, whether it's to the Heroku platform or somewhere else, if someone else has already deployed those layers, then I don't have to transfer them. And so I can transfer an entire image, including an operating system, in just a fraction of a second in some, in some cases. Nice. And I would assume there's also some benefits there, like you were talking about keeping developers out from the grunt work of updating the OS and patching the OS. So so I would assume that also makes it easier yeah. on one framework. I can I can have an OS patch and not have to worry about the 15 to 100 apps that are relying on it. Yeah, and that's really what separates build packs from the rest of this Docker and container ecosystem is that build packs can sort of go in strategically and update specific layers without affecting uh, the other layers in the image. So build packs uh, can update the layer that contains your Java runtime without having to rebuild your application. They can update the layers that contain your operating system and some of those lower level packages without having to make any modifications to your app or even really uh, running any of your your build process at all. Gotcha. So taking a step back for the unfamiliar, what exactly is Docker and how is it working with build packs? Yeah, so Docker is a what's called container technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, So if you're familiar with virtual machines, which are essentially like operating systems that run inside of operating systems, Docker is like a very lightweight version of that where you're Mm. you're only running you're not running an entire operating system inside of your operating system 
you're leveraging your base operating system for some of the primitive capabilities like scheduling processes, but you have a container, which is an isolated environment in which you can run those processes. And so you get the sort of illusion of having a, your own virtual machine, but in a much lighter weight capacity. And so that, that technology has, has been around for a long time, actually. Heroku was built on a uh, container technology called LXC, Linux uh, containers, back, you know, 10 years ago. But Docker came around, I think, in 2015 or so. I think sounds mm -hmm. about right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it it brought that kind of technology to the broader developer ecosystem, made it accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, so people can do it on Mac and on Windows as well as on Linux. And it allows you to, to create these sort of isolated environments that mm -hmm. can directly reproduce the environment that you're running in the cloud. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that's, I was going to say, that's that's a really interesting. What do you think was kind of the, the magic there behind Docker that really made it so accessible for developers? I think it, very much in, this, it, in the same way that Heroku simplified some of the cloud infrastructure, mm -hmm. Docker simplified the uh, container infrastructure. And mm -hmm. I, I draw that parallel because if you look at the commands that you would run with Docker, they are the exact same commands that you would run for Heroku. So uh, Got it. <laughs> Docker push, like Heroku's git push Heroku master, mm -hmm. uh, Docker run, like Heroku run. Got um, it. It's not a coincidence that those things are very similar. Mm -hmm. um, and that that was intentional. I think the, the difference for Docker was that they weren't trying to build you know, a, a cloud platform. They were just focused on that container technology. Got it. Got it. And we might be retreading here a little bit, but then Docker also kind of restructured those layers, right? Like originally containers were kind of based like a tree, like Git. And then this allowed for this evolution for the layers to be sw swapped out, not necessarily in terms of branches. Am I, am I saying that right? Uh, yeah. So Docker introduced this layer concept too. So before that, uh, the uh, there really wasn't a structure. Uh, so that's what I was saying with uh, the sort of old proprietary image format it was just Got a single it. compressed file. Um, and it would be sort of uh, launched inside of the container. But yeah, Docker introduced, in addition to those sort of developer experience features of, of making containers accessible, it also introduced this image format that allowed it to deduplicate layers and do things more efficiently. Okay. Um, and then taking it one level higher for people not familiar with Kubernetes, can you describe that and how it plays with build packs and things like Docker? Right. So if I back up to what I was saying about Docker not building a platform, mm -hmm. uh, when Docker became popular, the next thing everybody wanted was a platform for Docker. Got it. And that's the space that Kubernetes fills. It mm -hmm. uh, allows you to orchestrate your containers uh, and and build a platform out of them. So without Kubernetes, you have Docker on your local workstation, and that's great. It can help your development environment, but you still need a way to put those containers into production, make sure you know when they crash, restart them uh, when you need to restart them, launch new ones for administrative tasks, all that kind of boring infrastructure stuff. And Kubernetes provides a very powerful environment for not just running the containers, but operating them and, and mm -hmm. wiring them together and and doing all those important infrastructure level tasks. Got it. Okay, so, so I'm going to pitch an analogy to you. If we take a crate, a build pack is kind of like a really highly efficient way to organize that co the contents of that crate so that it can be easily used by anyone. Docker is like the container around that crate itself, and Kubernetes is kind of like the cargo ship that can hold those crates and move them around. How, how close am I? I think that could work. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the one thing I would change is that the build pack does sort of encapsulate a, a bunch of concerns. Mm -hmm. um, that, But it doesn't, the build pack doesn't really stick with you, right? Like the build pack is mm. a tool that you run mm. To, so that you can get a container. But mm. then when you're done with it, you kind of move on from it. Mm -hmm. um, like the build packs are not required at runtime. Mm. They, they may insert a few artifacts into your image that help you run it. Mm -hmm. But the build pack itself, you know, it, it's kind of like a drive-by shooting in, in a good way, I guess. <laughs> but it like, it, it, yeah, it, it, uh, it, that crate analogy, the way I guess I would change it is that you sort of open up the crate, drop some things off, 
and mm-hmm. then the crate goes away. And then the next time you change your code and need to create a new container, you can use that that crate, that build pack again. Got it. So kind of like magic crates. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, one of the reasons I wanted to put some of this content together was to give people kind of an introduction to some of the technology that's been behind a kind of another huge trend that we've seen for for years. And uh, we're seeing it with Salesforce functions and things like that. H- how is this technology helping enable like microservices? Like why, why is microservices, I, I feel like almost dependent on this kind of technology? Yeah, I, th- I would say that it's what containers allow you to do is treat your services, the, the components that make up your your software systems uh, as commodities. Mm. You can dispose of them. You can replicate them. Um, you can stand up lots of them. Um, you can run them in very lightweight environments. Uh, all of those things yeah, I think that I think they are essential to the microservice architecture because when you start to embrace microservices, you very much increase the sort of components that are that are running in in your system mm-hmm. uh, and all the interactions that they have. Um, and so this these new concepts uh, allow you to deal with those concerns more efficiently. Gotcha, because it definitely feels like. You know, for maybe some of us old school client server guys where it's like it's just a monolith of mm-hmm. application strength. But when what the but the world we're kind of walking to is it's more ephemeral and more agile, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Although I definitely some of these principles, I think, have value to the um, a more monolithic app as well. And, uh-huh. and that transition happened um Oh, maybe it's still happening, mm-hmm. um, but around the same time as as the interest in microservices, and mm-hmm. a lot of this was driven by uh, Heroku. Uh, and Heroku created this methodology called the Twelve Factor App, and it defines twelve factors or principles mm-hmm. that uh, lead to more scalable, uh, more maintainable applications. And those principles really are, in my opinion, the foundation for microservices because they speak to the disposability and, and all those other things I was just talking about. But they're also used by people working on more monolithic applications because even though they may only have a single app or monolith, they still need to be able to scale it and uh, replicate it and create test environments where they mm. can you know, test stuff and and whatever. So that's interesting. And I know we can't go down a rabbit hole with this because I know I've put theater sessions together on on the the twelve factor app. Uh, so we don't and we don't have another twenty minutes, but but maybe give us a little more of a deep dive like a medium dive into that. Like like how are what are some of those principles and how are they relatable to like a development cycle? Yeah. Uh, so you know they're They cover a lot of different areas, including how you do development, how you do Uh operations, how you do deployment. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that, yeah, I think there's a few that are that are particularly related to our conversation. One is treating your apps as uh, as uh, making your applications disposable, which, again, relates to this idea of containers and being able to sort of uh, discard, restart, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Another is a 12 factor app has as close as possible to dev prod parity. So your development environment uh, is close to identical with your production mm, environment. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. again, this is something that containers and build packs make possible. Whereas, you know, prior to 12 factor app, you might have special tooling that you run locally, but you don't run in production. And then that can make uh, debugging production issues very complicated and things like that. Gotcha. Um, so let's talk brass tacks. If people want to start to you know, move their applications into a cloud native build pack. What are the tools? What are the prerequisites that they need in order to start getting that work done? So there's a as part of the open source project, uh, there's a CLI called the Pack CLI, P A C K, mm-hmm. and it runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And once you install this CLI, you can run the Pack build command on any application. Um, it'll ask you what set of build packs you want to use. And I would recommend the Heroku build packs. <laughs> but once you have those, they will recognize a Node app or a Java app or a Python app. There's about seven main different types of apps 
that our, our build packs support by default. Gotcha. Uh, and so, so that pack build command, the end result is a Docker image. And then from there, it's just a matter of running it. And going back to our, our Minecraft example, because I can see where, a, for, well, actually, let me follow up just on that. So if I have a fairly vanilla, straightforward node application, are we just talking about basically a, a few lines of a command line operation and I'm done? For you as the developer? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, yeah, it's just that pack build command. Got and it. The, Got it. it. The build itself runs inside of a container and then all of those other steps like npm install or whatever it may be. Uh, are executed as essentially sub processes inside of that. Got it. Got it. Um, but then to to bring it back to the Minecraft example, how do you get into like how do you identify some of those edge cases you were talking about, like having to have a secure tunnel, and then how do you resolve some of that kind of stuff? Yeah. So the, I mean, the Minecraft build pack is funny because you don't have a Minecraft app. Right. <laughs> it just sort of <laughs> just sort of installs Minecraft for you. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, I'd love to enhance it. Uh, I mean, you can drop like configuration files in there. Like mm. there's, I think, an admin JSON and a whitelist. So you you put some of your your source code is essentially just those configuration files. Got but in it. the future, I'd like for it to support, uh, I think they're called extensions or plugins or something like that. Mm, the, the Whatever the modern version of Minecraft mods are. Right. But in but in the case of Minecraft, it, it just knows that it's going to need that secure tunnel. Mm. And the build packs install like ngrok and some other tools that will handle that for you. Gotcha. But, yeah, but there are other build packs, you know, like the more standard ones like Java or Python that can detect you know, what what kinds of things your application will need. Like mm. in, in the case of Python, it'll detect if you need SQLite mm -hmm. uh, and then install that into your image too. Got it. And where can people go to learn more about this? Uh, buildpacks.io is where we have our documentation uh, and some other important links to videos and content you can learn from. There's also a link to our Slack, which I believe is slack.buildpacks.com or buildpacks.slack.com. One of the two, the link is on the buildpacks.io webpage. Uh, we have a pretty healthy community there that's eager to answer your questions and help you work through any issues you might encounter. And that's our show. Now, before we go, I did ask Joe about his favorite non-technical hobby, and it turns out he really likes staring into the sky. Oh, uh, astronomy. Uh, nice. Well, I guess that's actually kind of technical because I do astrophotography, but oh. I very much prefer the non-technical astronomy, just visual, visual observing. Nice, nice. What kind of gear do you need for, what was that again? Astro the, astrophotography? Yeah. Expensive gear. <laughs> Many is that cameras. Like, is, I was going to say, is it just like a super expensive camera or is it like a very specific kind of camera? You can do astrophotography with a fairly inexpensive DS DSLR. Okay. However, it is incredibly addictive and you will inevitably spend thousands of dollars on a more expensive camera. Yeah, I, I love recommending to people a very inexpensive setup. And when I say inexpensive, uh, you know, I mean like maybe under $1,000. Got it. Um, but it's very easy to get carried away with. This is why I never got my first tattoo. <laughs> I want to thank Joe for the great conversation and information. And of course, I want to thank you once again for listening. Now, if you want to learn more about this podcast, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. And a special note, we have now started putting the episodes of the podcast up on YouTube. If that just happens to be a place you hang out. I'll talk to you next week. Bye.